Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, you see, I'm donning my Father's Day tie that Silas made for me, actually last Sunday. So, uh, so happy Father's Day to everyone. Um, in addition to the uh, Lord's Supper elements that I mentioned just a moment ago, you probably also saw right uh, beside them are some Father's Day gifts. And so if you did grab one of those on your way out, you can grab a Father's Day gift, a little pocket knife. You can always use uh, another pocket knife, right? So, uh, so that's that's our gift to you. Um, we have uh, we have kind of a unique crowd this morning because uh, a lot of our uh, regular members, regular attenders, are gone this morning. Uh, but we have a lot of guests as well. So, so happy that you're with us. Uh, in fact, among those gone this morning are Alex and his family, and uh, and, and Carrie's gone as well. So, uh, uh, I'll be uh, taking care of some of the music. And Jim, where is Jim? Okay. <laughs> All right. So there, there we go. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so we'll have Jim with us again. So we'll kind of uh, go back to the olden days, and uh, and uh, thankfully Bonnie's here to play the piano for us because uh, Carrie, Carrie and her family are gone as well. But uh, just want to start off with a few announcements. Uh, so first of all, if you look in your bulletin, uh, you'll see that there's a. Uh, WMU uh, meeting coming up. It's going to be at the church uh, with uh, Joanne Stone hosting. That's at 7 o'clock on Monday. And of course, we have uh, other regular things going on. Uh, tonight we have uh, the last of our study on the four views of the end times. Um, and, uh, and then we've got uh, the summer book study Wednesday and choir practice, youth, all that. So um, remember those things. Uh, we're going to vote on something here in a minute, but uh, one other uh, announcement that I think prob probably most of you know about this by now, but I want to make sure that you're aware um, that uh, not yesterday, not Saturday, but a, a week ago Saturday, uh, we hosted a funeral here at the church, and uh, there weren't any of our members present. It was, it was, uh, it was for uh, others in the community. Um, uh, I was here in and out to, to facilitate. But anyway, uh, there was there was a positive uh, COVID case, and so I just wanted to make you aware of that. If you weren't uh, aware of that before, because it, it was in our church building, uh, that was uh, over a week ago now. Um, but uh, it's one of those things, you know. We uh, even though here in Missouri, you know, all the restrictions are gone now, and and, and everything's open back up fully. Of course, uh, the virus is is still here, and so uh, so we need to remember that if you have any kind of symptoms. Of course, stay at home, and and you know we're, we're trying to strike a balance on um, on uh, what precautions to continue to take and, and, and how to go back to normal. You know, we're still uh, not passing the plate. We have the plates back there, but at some point we'll probably pass, start passing the, the plate again uh, for the Lord's Supper. We we have uh, these little pop tops, uh, but uh, at some point we'll go back to to doing it the old way. But we're just going to have to evaluate and. And uh, there's, you know, uh, maybe future waves to come, and so it'll, it might be an off and on kind of thing. But, uh, but anyway, just wanted to make you aware of that. Uh, one other thing before before we uh, go to our uh, our voting, um, there's a, our prayer sheet is back there uh, by the entrance. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, where you can write down prayer requests, and we'll have a deacon come up and share those. We'll start that again uh, next week. So, but just uh, be aware that we have that sheet back there now, so you can. Uh, jot down any prayer requests that you have. Um, the voting, uh, you'll remember last week I mentioned that uh, you know, we didn't have our April business meeting because of the uh, pandemic, and, and our April meeting is normally when we uh, would uh, vote on the nominating committee members, and in fact we just got those uh, secured anyway as far as those who are going to be nominated. And so I'm going to put forth uh, these uh, uh, nominations, and, and we'll vote on them, right? So these, this is for those who will uh, then go and nominate those for, for other committees. Okay, so we have Ray McCurdy, Randy Jarman, Sheila Gosney, Georgia Rothweiler, and Emily McMath. Okay, and so uh, two of those are holdovers. The last two, Georgia and Emily, are holdovers from last year, and then the other three are, are, are new. So uh, do we have a motion to approve these nominations? Okay, Karen. All right, I think Karen got to it first. Karen Pope. Uh, any discussion on that? All right. Do we have a second? Okay, second back back there, Steve. Um, okay, all in favor? Raise your right hand. Opposed? Same sign. I think I did the discussion in the wrong place, but I think that's okay. All right. 
So, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get them to work on, on these uh, nominations and then uh, we'll, we'll see what time span they need and we'll, we'll figure out when exactly we'll be voting on these, uh, these new committees. Okay. Um, I think that covers everything. Uh, just there's a few other things that I'll just let you look at there in the bulletin yourself. We do have home fellowship. I'll go ahead and mention it. We have home fellowship at the Gottman's house, not tonight, but next Sunday night. And so if you want to help with food, uh, you can get with, uh, with Donna and, and ask her uh, what, what you might be able to bring. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to switch my tie up for a guitar. And we're going to go into our call to worship. I'm going to read from uh, Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation from Israel would come out from Zion. When the Lord restores the, fortress, the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. You know, that, uh, that psalm is a little bit depressing until you get to the end. And, and there are a number of psalms like that. It's, it's important that we don't uh, skim over those, that we read them. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, this is a, a difficult time in our country, not, not only with the pandemic, but just with the, the way our nation is torn apart on, on other issues, some of them surrounding race. But then, of course, you, you have uh, uh, just the, the, the riots and, and all kinds of unrest. And I don't know about you, but when, uh, you know, it, it kind of puts you at, at in a depressed kind of state, kind of making not at ease, and um, uh, so it's uh, it's important that we uh, we recognize that you know the, the, the psalmists uh, they, they felt this way at times, and uh, and we we recognize those feelings, but at the same time we we uh, recognize that God's in control, that we uh, look to Him, look to His salvation, and so that's what we want to do this morning. We're going to sing, um, "Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing." And I, I had uh, planned that song earlier this week, and then, and then later I thought, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I love singing happy songs, but I'm just not very happy. And, uh, but you know, this, this song is, is calling upon the Lord uh, to, to bring blessings. And, and, and so we need to do that, uh, maybe especially in times of, of turmoil that we're in now. Um, but, but also we need to recognize that blessings in the Bible uh, don't always maybe measure up to what we think of when we think of blessings. In fact, you know, look at, look at the Beatitudes where Jesus says, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you when people persecute you. Blessed, and, and he goes on through all this list. And so, so sometimes God, God's blessings might come in forms that we uh, don't expect. Um, uh, but uh, but in, however he chooses to bless us, we want the Lord uh, to, to shower his blessings upon us so that we can in turn uh, bless others. So I didn't really intend to give a, a, a mini sermon there, but um, but hopefully that's helpful. Let's let's stand together as we as we sing that. <clears throat>
seated. We're going to move into our time of prayer. And so uh, we're going to begin by having a time of silent prayer for us to pray for and different burdens on our heart. Of course, there are many things in our country to pray for. Uh, I know that we all have our own burdens as well that we are facing. And then finally, since this is Father's Day, it's a good time to, to thank God for our fathers, uh, to thank God for uh, being our Heavenly Father, but also also to pray for those who uh, maybe uh, don't have a, a positive experience. That might be you, um, uh, people who, uh, who don't have um, maybe much to celebrate as far as our earthly father is concerned. And so we, we, uh, we want to, uh, uh, to lift all those up to the Lord, and, and we want to uh, take this time also just to prepare our hearts for worship. And so let's take, take some time, and Bonnie's going to play quietly on the piano, and, uh, and then I will close us. Let's pray. before you this morning. We, we want to lay them at your feet to trust you with them, uh, knowing that uh, you have promised that you will work all things for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we, we trust that. We, we trust, Lord, that your kingdom uh, is advancing, that you will accomplish all that you have promised. Uh, sometimes it is uh, hard to see exactly how that is playing out. Uh, God, we, we pray for our country. Uh, we pray for, for justice. We pray for peace. We pray for unity, especially within the body of Christ, Lord. Uh, we pray that, uh, that we will lead the way that will be a light uh, in the darkness. God, we, uh, we bring all of our other burdens to you this morning. And we also come to you with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for uh, our fathers, for Maybe even men who are not our fathers but have had a, a fatherly role in our life, a good influence. Uh, I pray, Lord, that, that the men in this congregation can be that for um, others, uh, not only their own children. And, and Lord, we do uh, recognize uh, you as our Heavenly Father. Uh, and uh, and we, we come to you in worship this morning. Worship in the name of Jesus, and we pray, Lord, that as we continue on in this service, that um, that uh, you would be honored by our worship, and we pray that you'll speak to us by your Spirit through your Word. We pray all this in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, you would stand again as we as we continue to sing. Hymn number seven, although I noticed our hymnals are gone. Paul? Not me. I found one up here, though. Okay, join with me as we sing. Uh, Come let us worship and bow down. I think twice through Bonnie. Is that okay with you? All right.
continue singing with In Christ Alone, hymn number 506. morning every guy how are you guys doing good doing good all right I got a couple things in my hand I would pass it around but that's probably not a good idea all right one of them is a buckeye and one of them is a two dollar bill now I'm doubting that you know but do, what do you think these two things may have in common that people may use them for sometimes go ahead to buy things, to buy things. that's yeah this the money yes you're right but there's another thing that kind of maybe not so much anymore, but a lot of people, maybe even some out in the congregation do. Go ahead and name it. Collecting. That's another good one. Some people carry these things around for good luck. You know, some people think if you carry a Buckeye in your pocket, it'll bring you good luck. Or some people in their wallet, they'll have a $2 bill folded up and they'll carry it with them every place they go for good luck. 
and they think that brings them good luck. What I wanted to talk about is what Chad was saying earlier. He talked about blessings. You know, in a way, sometimes you could probably interchange blessings with, and some people say luck. You know, some people say, man, that guy's lucky. And, you know, some people think this will bring you luck if you carry this. But what really brings you luck is if you follow God. If you follow God and have Jesus in your heart, then God's blessings will rain down on you. Which means things not always will go good, but a lot of times in the long run, things will go good. So let's say a quick prayer, and then you guys can go back to your seats. Dear God, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for uh, bringing these children to your house. Lord, I thank you for the parents that, that go to the effort, Lord, to bring them up knowing you. Just ask that you be with everyone in this congregation and bless them and watch out for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. great to uh, hear the choir again. It's been a little while. Uh, Steve, I might need you to turn me up just a little bit. Um, and uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 27 this morning. 
Uh, so we're, we keep trudging along here in Exodus. Um, but I, I want to begin this morning by going back to the very beginning. And uh, in due time, we'll see how this uh, correlates with the passage this morning. But uh, we go all the way back to Genesis. Of course, we see Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we have uh, creation and, and some, some really important events in these first three chapters of Genesis. Of course, uh, the, the pinnacle of God's creation is, is Adam and Eve. Uh, he places them uh, in a place called Eden, in a garden. And specifically in that garden, um, Adam and then later Eve, uh, is, uh, they're called to, to work and to keep it. Right? This, is, this is to be kind of a sanctuary for them. They had um, unfettered access to God, perfect fellowship with him in this garden. And it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was the Garden of Eden. It was uh, a quite, quite a glorious thing. Uh, but then, as we all know, something uh, terrible happened. Something went terribly wrong. Uh, Adam and Eve... Uh, were, were tempted and, and they sinned. They, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and because of that sin, uh, well, first of all, they were kicked out of the garden. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, we, we see that the effects uh, of, that uh, the, the sin has had uh, great effects on the earth even to this day. I want to read from uh, Genesis 3.24, whenever Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. It says... He, that is God, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, of course, the tree of life was there in the garden, and that was a tree that they could eat from, a tree that would give them eternal life. Um, uh, but then there was also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, uh, which they were told not to eat from. And because of their sin, they were kicked out of the garden. And not only that, but we see that here at the east of the garden, that there was a cherubim with a flaming sword um, uh, there to, to guard this entrance so that they could not go back to this idyllic place that God had created for them. And, and uh, as I said, we, we see how, um, e even in these first three chapters of Genesis, we see uh, the curse of, of the ground and, and, and so on, and, and how sin uh, has permeated uh, really all of creation. So, so we see God's goodness in creation, but yet we also see uh, his brokenness. Uh, we, we see the brokenness of creation because of sin. Uh, think things have just haven't been quite right since... Um, Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. And, and there has been, uh, I think we can say, a longing in every human heart to go back to Eden. Uh, it may manifest itself in different ways, but I, I think we can see in every human heart that there is, there is a longing. That, that we all have this sense, right, that, that things are not as they should be. As I was speaking earlier about just uh, all the turmoil in our country right now. That's, uh, that really, uh, I think, illustrates for us. But, I mean, uh, just any time in our own lives, right? The sin in our own lives, I think, uh, also uh, vividly illustrates that things are not right in this world. And so we have this longing, that may be manifested in different ways, but this longing uh, to return back to Eden. I've mentioned this in a sermon before, but it's worth mentioning again. Um, uh, this uh, this idea of, of what the, the author of this book, Christ or Chaos, calls it post-Avatar Blues. You, you remember the movie Avatar? It was, it was uh, I don't know, maybe a good 10 years ago now, but um, let me just read to you a section from this book uh, about the movie Avatar and, and, and the way this movie actually stirred up uh, the longing uh, within people for some kind of idyllic world, right? And, and so uh, here's what it says. <clears throat> The reality was, this reality was demonstrated in the public response to the award-winning motion picture Avatar, which portrayed Pandora, an imaginary planet filled with beauty and wonder. Crowds flocked to the new film, but while ticket sales were sky high, the response from fans was surprising. Many moviegoers shared an experience that was eventually labeled post-Avatar blues. A depression rooted in the realization that Pandora was intangible. Some even described suicidal thoughts when contemplating how drab reality seemed in comparison to the cinematic world. 
Stephen Lane, one of the actors from the film, responded, Pandora is a pristine world, and there is the synergy between all of the creatures of the planet, and I think that strikes a deep chord within people that has a wishfulness and a wistfulness to it. And so, so, so even an unbelieving world recognizes that, that there's this longing, right? that, that, that there's something not quite right about our world, and there's something better uh, for which we long. Uh, we recognize as, as believers that, that this is rooted in the reality of, of how God created this world, how he created uh, Eden and for, and for Adam and Eve to, to live in harmony with one another in perfect fellowship with God. And, and, and that, was, that was soon lost. But we have a promise that, that we will one day return to that. And, and as I said, there's a longing in every human heart for that. Uh, and it's manifested in many different ways, I think. But anyway, the, the tabernacle, uh, I'm going to show some ways this morning how the tabernacle kind of points us back to Eden. Um, it represents Eden in at least a few ways. Uh, but but as, as we look at this, it's important for us to recognize that, that the purpose of the tabernacle, it, it wasn't to be a restoration of Eden. I think we see some, some hearkening back to Eden, but it wasn't to be a restoration of Eden. But I think we, we see this, especially looking in hindsight, uh, on this side of the cross, we see that the tabernacle was pointing the way back to Eden. Right? There's a big difference there, right? So, so it, uh, it has some Eden-like imagery to it, but it wasn't a restoration of Eden, but it was pointing them and even pointing us the way back to Eden. And so, um, as, as we've uh, moved along in Exodus, especially uh, chapter 25 and 26, uh, we've, we've been seeing the instructions for the tabernacle that, that were given to Moses. And we've, we've worked our way, just as the text does, from, from the innermost part of the tabernacle to the outermost part. Uh, and so it began with the furnishings of the most holy place, or the, the Holy of Holies, that is the, the Ark of the Covenant. Right? And then it goes uh, from there to the holy place and the furnishings there, and then the, the description of, of the tent itself. And then and now we make our way to the, the outer courtyard of the tabernacle and, uh, and the furnishings. And I've mentioned before that there are a couple of furnishings that get mentioned later. But for the most part, we see uh, the, these furnishings, and then it, it works its way outwards to even the... the uh, um, fence that goes along the outer court. And so the plan of attack this morning is that I'm going to read our text, and so we're going we're to continue that journey, working our way from the inside out, but then we're going to kind of reverse, and we're going to work, work our way from the outside in. And, uh, and that's how we're going to see uh, specifically how the tabernacle points us to the way back to Eden. And so uh, if you would go ahead and stand with me in honor of reading God's Word, we're going to read here in chapter 27, uh, verses 1 through 19. You shall make the altar of acacia wood five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. And you shall make horns for it on its four corners. Its horns shall be in one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. And you shall make pots for it to receive its ashes and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans. You shall make all of its utensils of bronze. You shall also make for it a grating, a network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. And you shall set it under the ledge of the altar so that the net extends halfway down from the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. And the poles shall be put through the ring, so that the poles are on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. You shall make it hollow with the boards. As it had been shown to you on the mountain, so shall it be made. Verse 9. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the side of the court you shall have hangings of fine twine linen, a hundred cubits long for one side. Its twenty pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets uh, shall be of silver. And likewise, for, it, uh, for its length on the north side, there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, its pillars twenty and their bases twenty of, of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side, there shall be hangings for fifty cubits with ten pillars and ten bases. The breadth of the court on the front side uh, to the east shall be 50 cubits. 
The hangings for one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and three bases. On the other side, the hangings shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and the three bases. For the gate of, uh, of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall have four pillars with it um, and, and with the four bases, with them all four bases. All the pillars around the court shall be uh, filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their bases of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the breadth 50, the height 5 cubits, with hangings of fine twined linen and bases of bronze. And the utensils of the tabernacle for every use, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Let's pray. God, as we read this passage of scripture, we see lots of details, details that are, that are easy to get uh, lost in. Uh, but we pray, Lord, that um, we will uh, glean the insight that you would have for us this morning from this passage and, and help us to see what the tabernacle is pointing us to. And I pray that we'll rejoice in that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, a couple of headings this morning as we look at this text. And again, we're going to kind of approach it backwards now as we begin to make our way from the outside in. We'll be focused in this text. We're going to mention some other things that we've uh, looked at in the uh, past couple of sermons. Uh, but this, this first heading is the tabernacle in Eden. Because uh, I mentioned that, that there are uh, some ways that the tabernacle points to Eden. There are at least some parallels between the tabernacle and Eden. Um, as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to get lost in the details. But, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, that's why it's important for us to recognize the, um, uh, the importance of all of Scripture. Oftentimes, in these and these details that can seem uh, overwhelming or maybe even mundane, uh, there are little gems to be found. And so that there, there's one very important thing that sticks out uh, in the latter part of our section this morning. In, in verse 13, I want you to notice something in verse 13. The breadth of the court on the front to the east shall be 50 cubits. Now, now it's almost just mentioned in passing. It would be something very, very easy to, to overlook. But no, notice, notice where the front of the court is. It is to the east. There, there, there's, a, there's a reason for that. Um, do you remember when I read from, from Genesis, the, the cherubim with the flaming sword, uh, where, where, where was the cherubim to be stationed? At the east of the garden. In fact, it, it was stationed at the east of the garden. And so uh, I, I think we see here something intentional with the tabernacle in that its, its orientation was to be facing towards the east. And so you know, they, would, they would pick the, this up and move as they wandered in the wilderness, but it would always be oriented east. In fact, um, one thing I noticed in the, uh, in the image, and we'll, we'll bring the image up later. We'll go ahead and bring it up for us, if you would, Lori. Um, and we'll come back to it again. So uh, the orientation of this isn't helpful because technically the top is the south and the bottom is the north. Uh, in, in other illustrations of the tabernacle, uh, they, they have a turn around, which I think is more helpful to show that uh, uh, the entrance would be to the east. Okay, And so uh, that's, that's, that's important, and I think that's just one of, of a number of parallels that we see to, with the Garden of Eden. Okay, so... Um, what are some others? Well, uh, re remember I said that Adam and Eve were to work and to keep the garden. Remember that in, in Genesis? Uh, he's, Adam is, is told to, to work and to keep the garden. Well, um, this same language is, is used of the priest multiple times, especially in the book of Numbers. And this is something that's easy to miss because sometimes these words are translated differently. But, uh, but, but, but those, those words, to work and to keep, are, are given for the priest in the tabernacle. And so you see that, in a sense, you might say that Adam had a priestly function in the Garden of Eden. 
Or you could say that the, the priests have a function like Adam uh, as, as they are working in the tabernacle. But there's another parallel there. And, and there, there are many others. Just one other example. Uh, you know, some have pointed out how the, uh, the oil lamp, which we looked at uh, a week or two ago, uh, the, the oil lamp um, may very well be representative of the tree of life. And, 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 and uh, we read in other uh, places in the Old Testament of, of certain carvings. Uh, in, in the uh, tabernacle or later in the temple that, that have a garden-like type uh, ambiance. And so, and so uh, there have been many things that, uh, that students of the Bible have pointed out that seem to be parallels to the Garden of Eden. But again, to be clear, the tabernacle was not to be a restoration of Eden, but I think it does point us the way back to Eden. Okay? So we're going to dive into that some more as we go along, but first, uh, let's just make a couple more observations about the outer court, because again, we're, we're going to work our way from the outside back in, and so we have that outer court, so go ahead and bring that uh, image up for us again, Lori, and so you see, um, uh, you see that uh, basically a fence uh, made mostly of linen that goes around, you see the gate is a little bit different, and I'll, I'll mention that here in a moment, um, but, uh, but this, uh, of, of course, one thing that's important, again, is, is its orientation, that it's uh, faces uh, in the east, so the direction is important, but also the dimensions. It's always helpful to get an idea of the dimensions. And uh, in, in the, the ESV, um, it, it gives the measurements in cubits, which is, is what we have in, in the original Hebrew, but we don't measure by cubits, so it's helpful for us to put it in feet. Remember, a cubit was about from your elbow to the tip of your finger, which is about 18 inches, and so if we do the math, um, the, the outer court of the tabernacle was about 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. And so you see that in verses 11 through 13, and it's stated more succinctly in verse 18. And then the materials. So, uh, so we see that, that white material is, is this fine twined linen. We read about that in verse 9. Uh, we read about the, the bases of bronze, the hooks of silver in verse 10. And so these, these are costly, uh, precious materials. Uh, but notice there's no gold, right? So, so if you'll remember, as, as we looked at the inner part, uh, the, the actual tent of the tabernacle, you know, there's, there's gold overlaying uh, the furnishings, but, e but even the structure inside the tent. Um, but there's no gold on the outside. And I, I think this makes sense because, you know, as you make your way uh, inward, you're, you're kind of coming into more hallowed ground, you might say, right? Uh, with the Holy of Holies being the place where God's presence was uh, was there most powerfully and so uh, so that makes sense uh, however there there is uh, um, not only fine fine linen but we do have the the scarlet of, of uh, red and purple and um, what's the other color I don't know, the, 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 the color the, the colored yarn um, yes the, that, that we have for the gate and, uh, and that's appropriate because of the importance of the gate, the, the entry into this tabernacle. Okay? And so, um, as we make our way through that gate, as we continue into the tabernacle, I want to point out uh, two things that are very much different from Eden, and yet necessary to show us the way back to Eden. Okay? So that brings us to... Uh, the next of these head in, headings, and that is an altar and a curtain. So, of course, the altar, uh, that's, that's what's really um, uh, key in, in this passage this morning. That's, that's what we have a description of in verses 1 through 9. And that altar was, was front and center as you enter the tabernacle. So I mentioned that uh, uh, I've had the privilege a couple of times to, uh, to see this life-size replica of the tabernacle in Eureka Springs. And it's really helpful to actually be able to walk around it and kind of see what, what it was like. And, but yeah, you've got this big altar right there, front and center, when you walk in. Would you go ahead and, um, go ahead and bring up, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's the bronze altar right there. And so we'll uh, talk more about the description of it. But that, that was... Uh, right there as you walk into the courtyard, okay? Um, more or less, uh, it was, it was kind of like a grill, uh, a grill. I, I, yeah, Emily's smiling. I, I, I say my words wrong sometimes. I've got to, maybe it's the Texan in me or something. It's like a grill. Um, it's a grill. 
And, uh, and if, if, if you know me well, uh, you know I like to grill. I'm a big charcoal guy, right? I'm like, all right, it's, it's, it's charcoal or nothing. No, no propane. And I just got to say, you know, I accept. So even this altar, right, it, was, it had charcoal, no propane, all right? And, and by the way, Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, grilled with charcoal too. All right? whenever, <laughs> whenever he uh, made breakfast for the disciples on the beach, says he made a fire, and the fire had gone down to coals, and then he, and he cooked breakfast for them. Uh, I don't know how many of you like fish for breakfast, but that's what they did back then. But, you know, Jesus didn't use propane either, right? He used, he used charcoal. So just, just putting that out there. But, uh, but this, this, I mean, it's kind of like a big charcoal grill because, uh, the, you know, underneath, you, you see there that, that grate, and so underneath is where the fire would be. And, of course, it would go down to coals, and they would use this for burnt offerings, all right, let me find my place here. So, um, uh, verses 1 through 8, uh, there's a pretty thorough description. Um, it's made of acacia wood, just like all the other furnishings, but instead of being uh, coated with gold, it was coated with bronze, which is still, you know, good, uh, good uh, costly metal. Um, it was square, it had four horns, we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Um, uh, if we put the cubits in the feet, it was about uh, seven and a half feet across, and four and a half feet wide, okay? So uh, a big, a big uh, furnishing there. It was carried the same way as the other furnishings. Uh, it had the, the poles that would go uh, through, through those loops on the side because again, you know, this was the tabernacle that they'd have to transport from place to place as they, uh, as they went through the wilderness. And so that was also made of acacia wood, these poles made of acacia wood and coated with bronze. Um, all right, so, uh, and you see the grating, uh, like, like I said, this, this is kind of like a big charcoal grill, but, um, you know, all joking aside about, uh, you know, using charcoal versus propane, uh, this, this was for serious business, right? This wasn't just for a weekend cookout. This, this was for sacrifices, for burnt offerings. And so, and so... It's important for us to recognize the seriousness of that. It's also important for us to recognize um, how, how this would show us right away that this is not Eden. Because in Eden, at least before sin, uh, there was no need for sacrifices, right? Now, one could argue that the very first sacrifice was made whenever God clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of animals, right? An animal had to lose its life for them to be clothed. But before sin, before sin came into the world, when, when Adam and Eve were, were in Eden with perfect fellowship with God, there was no need for sacrifices. So right away, you walk into the tabernacle. Yes, again, the, the, there, are, there are different parallels with Eden and, and, the, and the direction that it faces and, and, and different things within the tabernacle. But right away, you see this altar for sacrifices and you know, okay, this is not Eden. The, 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 the altar is, is a reminder of our sin, isn't it? It's a reminder of our sin. And, but it's also a reminder of, or, or it, it points us to uh, the redemption for sin. It's ultimately found in Jesus. And so, so while it was not Eden, it points us the way to Eden, doesn't it? And so, uh, of course, uh, again, on this side of the cross, we can see clearly how this points to Jesus. But even in, in their time, they, they recognized that there was a need for an atonement. Right? That, that, that sin can't just be swept under the rug. That there, there was some way that sin had to be addressed. And so that's what the altar was for. You know, it's important that we don't lose sight of how central uh, sacrifice is to our faith. And so we look throughout the Old Testament and we see, you know, it's, it's interesting that even before the giving of the law, sacrifices were made, right? So, so when, when, when God gives uh, the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, there are, there are many more specifics that are given. This whole sacrificial system is set up. But we read even before that, uh, again, maybe we could even go back to the very first sacrifice made in the Garden of Eden when, when God clothes Adam and Eve. But then after that, you know, Cain and Abel, right? They're, they're, they're bringing offerings to God, uh, even sacrifices. And then we read of, of, uh, of other figures in the Old Testament and their sacrifices, even before the giving of the law. There's, there's kind of this, just, just, just as we have this inward longing to go back to Eden, we have this inward um, recognition of the need for sacrifice. It's even seen in other religions, isn't it? 
right? So, so, so even though uh, they, they are worshiping uh, a false god, there's a recognition, even in other religions, that there is a need for atonement. That, that there's something not right that needs to be made right. So that kind of goes hand in hand with our longing for Eden, doesn't it? And so, uh, so although Eden uh, had no need for sacrifice, you, you, you walk into the tabernacle, you see that altar, and it points us the way back to Eden. Because, because we see that through Christ, our sins are forgiven. And not only that, but we have this promise of the restoration of Eden. And so we're going to get to that as, as we move along. But, but again, it, it's important that we don't lose sight of the centrality of the sacrifice in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament, right? Because Jesus coming and being the fulfillment of, of everything that the sacrificial, that sacrificial system pointed forward to, uh, he came and he was the final sacrifice, the sacrifice once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. And so, um, back to the, to, to the altar here, this, you know, sacrifices were burnt on the altar throughout the year, right? There are, we, we talked uh, in, in an earlier sermon about the different kinds of sacrifices, different kinds of offerings, and there's some overlap between them, and there's even some ambiguity. Uh, but there were many sacrifices that were made, many, many burnt offerings that were given throughout the year. Um, but uh, one that was very special, uh, we read about in Leviticus 16, on the Day of Atonement, uh, the high priest... So in Leviticus 16, this is a specifying Aaron, because Aaron was a high priest at that time. Um, the high priest would, would kill a goat for, the, for a sin offering for the people. And its fat was to be burned on this altar, this altar in the tabernacle. But before that, uh, the blood was, was put on the four corners. And so you remember the four corners uh, of that altar. The blood was to be put on those four corners. And before that, the blood was to be put, uh, sprinkled on the mercy seat. And so remember the mercy seat is on the Ark of the Covenant, um, uh, there, there where the, the cherubim overshadow the, the, the seat of, the, of, of this Ark, this box that contains the Ten Commandments. And, and this, this is where the presence of God was uh, manifested in the most palpable way. And, and, and only once a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And, and, and even then, he would have to, we read in Leviticus, in Leviticus 16 of how they'd have to burn the incense to, so, so that smoke would kind of uh, impede the view of the Ark of the Covenant so that the high priest didn't die uh, by, by, by looking upon it. But he would go in once a year and he'd sprinkle that blood on the uh, mercy seat. And so, so only once a year could he go in there. And you'll remember that, uh, that there was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place and, and from, uh, from everything outside of it. Um, and, uh, and once again, we have with the curtain a, a reminder that this is not Eden. It's not Eden, but it does point us the way back to Eden. So just as the, the altar, we say, okay, yeah, there's a lot of things about the tabernacle that kind of, uh, kind of parallel Eden and, and, and give us a longing for Eden. But, you know, this, this altar, this is not Eden. There was no need for sacrifices in Eden. This curtain, this curtain is not Eden. Uh, Adam and Eve, they had perfect fellowship with God, but now in the tabernacle, there's a curtain that, that nobody can go past, only the high priest once a year uh, with great, great caution. So we have an altar and a curtain. So um, we talked about the curtain a little bit uh, when, whenever we uh, covered that uh, in a previous chapter. And so um, this curtain was not only present in the tabernacle, but then later in, in the first temple and in the second temple. And so for centuries, there was a curtain that would separate uh, the Holy of Holies from uh, the rest of the tabernacle for centuries. And only the high priest could go in to it until it was torn at Jesus' crucifixion. You know, what, what we see with Jesus is, well, so, so going back to the altar, we see the altar shows us the need for sacrifice. Jesus is that sacrifice. The curtain shows us our need for a high priest. Jesus is that high priest. Isn't that incredible? How, how Jesus is both our sacrifice and our high priest. Jesus shows us the way. He brings us back to Eden. Okay? So, so we're, we're going to draw to a close here pretty soon, but um, I just kind of want to give you the big picture here. 
All right, so um, again, we see that the, the entrance of the tabernacle, uh, the, the orientation of the tabernacle, even many things inside the tabernacle point towards Eden. They, they, they're kind of parallel Eden. They, in fact, bring about this longing for Eden. And, and just as a side note, you know, there are both positive and negative things that can stir up our longing for Eden. Um, so certainly, you know, you, you see what's going on in our world and just how broken the world is. You know, some, some of these negative things that we see, that can stir up our longing for, for what God has in store for us, can't it? And it should. But also there are good things that can, that can stir up our longing, right? The, the fellowship of the church, right? And so when we meet together, when we worship, when we have fellowship together, um, that gives us a little, a little taste of Eden. And so, so that, in a positive way, should, should stir us up, should, should, should stir that longing for Eden. And really, I think the tabernacle was, was more of a ladder, right? I, I mean, e even though it was no Eden, as we see with the altar, as we see with the, with the curtain, even though it was no Eden, it was... Uh, it was a step in the right direction, right? This is where the people could um, could have atonement for their sins. This is where people could worship the Lord. This this is where uh, they had this high priest who would come and and mediate on their behalf. And so, and, and this this is this is where the presence of God was, uh, who, who would give them guidance and protection and, and so on. And so, so the tabernacle was a wonderful thing. It was a wonder. It, it was it was it was a um, pointing the way back to Eden. And so um, we, we've seen these stark differences, though, right, with, with the uh, altar and with the curtain. And again, um, the altar shows us our need for sacrifice. The curtain shows our need for a great high priest. And incredibly, Jesus is both of these for us. And so... Um, in Christ, we, we can have uh, the assurance that we will get back to Eden. So, uh, you know, we, we read in Scripture of, of this uh, new heavens and new earth that is going to be established uh, at the end of time, right? Christ is going to return. He's going to set all things right. Uh, we will be raised physically from the dead. We, we will have renewed bodies and live on a renewed earth, much like Eden, right? This this is real. This is true. Uh, this, this this longing is isn't isn't just some kind of fantasy, but 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 we're we're, we're looking forward to something that actually will happen, and we need to remember that, right? We need to remember that uh, in, in the bad times when when we think our world is falling apart, we say we say yeah, one day all things will be made right. Remember that when we have good times of fellowship and worship with the church, we say oh, this is only a taste of what is. To come, and 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 we and as we as we read our Bibles, of course, we see these uh, these clear and specific promises of the new heavens and the new earth. But even as we're looking in a book like like Exodus, and and, and we see the tabernacle, uh, we we can see types and shadows, right? That we we've seen this all throughout Exodus. We see it in the Old Testament how things point forward to Jesus and point forward to the inheritance that we have in Christ. And so uh, I think we see that in the tabernacle as as it, uh, again, it, um, it parallels Eden in, in many ways, but it is not a restoration of Eden. It is pointing us the way back to Eden. Um, the altar shows us our need for sacrifice. The curtain shows us our need for a great high priest. Jesus is both of those. And, 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 and when he returns, when he sets all things right, when we have this new earth, uh, there, will be, there will be no more altar. There will be no more curtain. Right? In fact, even, even now, in, in, in some sense, we're kind of living in the already but not yet. Right? Uh, in, in, in one sense, it's already true. Right? Jesus is our final sacrifice. And, and, and Jesus is our great high priest. He, stands, he sits at the right hand of God and he advocates for us. He is our mediator. Um, but we will, we will enjoy that in its fullness upon his return and the establishment of uh, the new heavens and new earth, the resurrection of the dead. And so what, what a, a wonderful thing to look forward to. In the meantime, we, we live with hope, right? We have hope because, because we know that, uh, you know, like going back to this, you know, post-Avatar Blues, 
All right, we, we don't need to be depressed like these moviegoers who say, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's just intangible. This, this, this world uh, that, that seems so wonderful that we long for, it's never going to happen. No, we have hope that it will indeed happen. And that even in the here and now, we, we get to um, have taste of that. We get to experience it uh, to some degree in a very real sense uh, through uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the church, uh, through our fellowship with God, through Jesus Christ. Um, but, uh, but a day is coming to where uh, we will enjoy it in its fullness. And so we have hope. We live with hope. We live as ambassadors um, in, in a foreign land, right? We, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. We're citizens of heaven, citizens of the, the new earth that is to come. And, and, and right now, we're, we're, we're living in this foreign land as ambassadors, right? We, we kind of we set up our stations. We might even call those churches, right? Churches as, as embassies. Uh, here in this foreign land, and so we, we are a light in the dark world, and we say, we say, hey, something better is coming, it's promised through Jesus Christ, and, and uh, we even work towards that end in the here and now as much as possible, right? We, we, we want to give people a taste of Eden. We want, we want to show people uh, what is to come, uh, and we, uh, we look forward and hope to its fullness. So with that, let's pray to the Lord. God, we we thank you for these wonderful promises and how we can even see them in, uh, in subtle ways in, um, in the Old Testament scriptures. We, uh, uh, we, we long for the restoration of all things. We long for the restoration of our bodies, the restoration of this earth. And we, uh, we, we trust, Lord, that it will come. We have, we have a hope like no other. So I pray that that will be evident in the way that we live. I pray, Lord, that we will indeed be ambassadors for your kingdom, that we'll be lights in this world for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to transition now to uh, the Lord's Supper. And so uh, we have uh, our elements here. I'll remind you um, how to go about this. Let's just go ahead and and do this together. We'll tear off the, the very top part. And uh, you have the little wafer. That tastes kind of like styrofoam, I'll warn you. Um, but you can go ahead and put that on your, on your lap. And then uh, if you want to open up the juice, you can. Or you can wait, whatever you want. We'll do the bread first and then the cup. Um, we'll have a little bit of time of examination first. And so, um, you know, I, I, uh, I read uh, the latter portion of 1 Corinthians 11 last time we took the Lord's Supper. So I won't do that again, but I want to summarize a couple of things as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. Um, because, you know, Paul, Paul says that it's important for us to examine ourselves before we partake. Um, we need to look, look deep within and, and, and make sure that we... Uh, are indeed repenting of our sins, that we're trusting in Jesus, because that's what this symbolizes, right? That Jesus is our sacrifice. And so are we trusting in him? Are we, are we turning to him uh, for uh, forgiveness and freedom from sin? So we examine ourselves. Uh, and it's a time for, if, if we, if we are, are not in, uh, repenting in one area of our life, this is the time to do it, right? To repent before the Lord. Uh, Paul also says that we need to discern the body. And, uh, and that's kind of an odd phrase. Uh, I, I think it uh, probably has a double meaning. I mentioned this last time. Um, so first of all, we discern the body, and as we take the Lord's Supper, we're, we're remembering Jesus' body broken for us, his blood shed for us, right? Uh, but also, in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, um, he's, he's chastising the Corinthians for when they take the Lord's Supper, how they were... Um, you know, it, it was more of a meal for them, and, and, and many of them would, would jump in line before the others and take up all the food, and they're even getting drunk on the wine, and, and, and so they were dishonoring the Lord's Supper, and he says, in fact, what you're doing isn't even the Lord's Supper. There, there, was, there was selfishness, there was disunity among the body, and so, so I, I think that uh, this, this is likely also referring to uh, your relationship with the body of Christ. That's why oftentimes you might hear uh, a pastor say, you know, before you take the Lord's Supper, you need to make sure that you're right with your brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to discern the body, uh, the body of Christ, uh, not only his physical body broken for us, but his body, the church. And so we need to think about that as we prepare ourselves. And we do this so that we don't 
partake in an unworthy manner. That's what Paul uh, warns against. And so uh, what I want to do is just give us uh, just a minute or so to, to pray to the Lord on our own, to, um, to prepare ourselves for the taking of the Lord's Supper, uh, and then we'll take together. So, well, Bonnie, if you can play quietly for us uh, for just a minute or so, and then we'll uh, continue on. to Jesus during this time, recognizing that he is our only hope, that he is the, uh, the one and only sacrifice for sin, and that he came not to only forgive us of our sin, but to free us from it. And so we, uh, we turn from our sin, we turn towards Jesus. Uh, we, we want to come uh, with a right heart, uh, recognizing our great need for Jesus and also embracing uh, his call uh, upon us to repent and to believe. And so we, uh, we do that this morning uh, and we, uh, we celebrate the uh, sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll say, um, you know, we... Uh, when we take the Lord's Supper, it's kind of, it's kind of mixed emotions. You know, in, in one sense, it is a celebration. Um, it, it, it was mirrored, or it, it's an offshoot of the Passover Seder, which, uh, which was celebratory in many ways, cel a, a celebration of the, the freedom of, of sin and, uh, and, and freedom from death that uh, the people of Israel had um, from the, the Passover lamb. And so, of course, that, uh, uh, that makes perfect sense. Uh, as it correlates with the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. So, so there's, there's some celebration there. But of, of course, we're also remembering Jesus' body and blood broken for us. And so there's uh, some, some somberness to it as well. But let's, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and partake now. And so you'll um, get the bread ready. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you stand with me? We're going we're to sing the doxology together a cappella, okay? So let's do that and we'll just Praise God from the room. 